Hi everyone, once again, welcome to Ad Addiction, a place where we get encouraged as we read through the Word of God. And I am your host, Reverend Lawrence Makumbi, the lead pastor of Life Pool Chapel, Kitengala, the House of Faith. And today, by God's grace, we're going to look through, you know, to read through the book of a Second Timothy. And, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul takes quite some, uh, you know, uh, labor. Yesterday we looked at, um, at the first book of uh, of. Of, of the first letter, sorry, of Paul to Timothy. And these are various, uh, uh, various things that mostly, uh, but mostly is that Paul was trying to write to Timothy, was writing to Timothy in, in, in actual sense, trying to instruct him in how he's going to handle himself and also, you know, uh, in regards to doctrine, in regards to his position, you know, as a, as a church leader. Remember we said that uh, uh, Timothy was actually like the, leader or the or, or the or, or the pastor of the church in Ephesus and so Paul is instructing him in the ways of how to handle various aspects in regards to ministry so today as we look through the second book of Timothy I want to believe that God is going indeed to be with us as we read through his word so why don't we begin with a word of prayer glorious and awesome father we come before you today we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, we exalt your holy name. Father, we declare indeed there is none like you. What an awesome wonder you are, and what a glorious opportunity that you have granted us today. As we look into the second letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, how we pray that our hearts will be open, our spirits will be alert, just to receive your word of life. We give you glory, and we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. We do trust, pray, and believe. Amen. So in a nutshell, you know, the book of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul is writing uh, to Timothy, his son in the faith, because uh, he led him uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he taught him in the, in the ways of the scriptures. And uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy a couple of years uh, later, uh, I think this is about AD 50, 54, uh, no, this is about AD 57. And... Uh, is um, is writing to Timothy and is telling Timothy number one to be steadfast to fight the good fight of faith because uh, you know the times that are coming will continue to be perilous so he's preparing Timothy as a servant of God and as as an overseer of the church in Ephesus to guard his faith to hold fast and you know it is in this that we see the apostle Paul actually writing. Uh, some of his last last words, you know, uh, in terms of letters, because people actually believe that this is the last letter of the Apostle Paul that he writes to Timothy. Remember in chapter number, in, in the first letter, he told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. But in, 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 second, in, second, in the second letter, he tells Timothy, I have already fought that fight. I have already kept that faith. You know, I've fought the fight, I've kept the faith, and now there lays a crown of righteousness. Uh, I had talking about is now ready to depart from the earth. Because at this time, the Apostle Paul is writing from his dungeon prison in, uh, in Rome. And we discover, you know, you'll discover that through church history, a very significant figure uh, in terms of persecuting the church, the, the, uh, the man Nero himself. And so, you know, half of Rome was set in fire and the Christians then were the easy scapegoat. And so a lot of believers have been persecuted, were being arrested and they were being, you know, told that they are the cause of, uh, of the fire in Rome. And so Paul knows it very well that where I am right now, there's only one thing that remains for me, for me to be executed. And this shall be for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's telling Timothy, follow after my pattern. Don't give up. Keep on fighting the good fight of faith. So let us see what the scriptures hold for us today. The second episode of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Again here, Paul is careful enough to let us understand, to let Timothy understand that he is an apostle, not because he chose to be one, not because men chose him to be one, but it is out of the will of God. So what Paul is trying to tell Timothy is, I as an apostle have been aligned with the will of God. To Timothy, a beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father 
and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Look at the motive, look at the condition under which the Apostle Paul serves the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants Timothy to follow that pattern. And as well we who are reading it today, that we should follow this pattern and serve God with a clean conscience. As my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. The Apostle Paul was not just a preaching apostle to Timothy, was not just a spiritual father in terms of I bore you in faith or I presented the gospel to you, but he also wanted Timothy to really understand that even though you are absent in the body with me, but I never cease to mention you in prayer. That's one key aspect of fatherhood that the father even though you may not be in the proximity in terms of um, you know being around here that even in my absence or in your absence i'm still praying for you greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that i may be filled with joy when i call to remembrance the heritage that is the genuine faith that is in you so Paul is cautious to tell Timothy, I understand. He knew there is a genuine faith. It is not fake, but it is genuine. Why do I know it is genuine? For it has dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, that's the lineage, and your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded is in you also. Now, the kind of faith we are talking, it's not a faith that you're born with. It is not genetically transmitted. Are we together? There are people who will say that, you know, I, oh, oh, my children will grow in my faith because I am a man of faith or I'm a woman of faith. It, faith is not genetically inherited. No, 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 no. You've got people who have worked with great faith, yet their children are atheists. The kind of faith here Paul is talking about when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, g g uh, the genealogy of the faith in Timothy, it is as a result, the person that received the gospel first was the grandmother, Lois, who later on brought it or taught it to her daughter, Eunice, who happens to be the mother of Timothy. And so Eunice took the, 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 the responsibility to teach Timothy in accordance to the scriptures. And this is something we shall see as we go on. The Apostle Paul talks about Timothy, about keep hold on the scriptures that you are exposed to when you are still a young man. So it is not genetically transmitted. Faith is taught. Faith is taught. Timothy was given the opportunity or the exposure to walk in faith because the scriptures were made available to him. So today, I might be a man of great faith, but it does not necessarily mean that my children will grow in great faith or to grow to have greater faith. It is my responsibility as their father. It is your responsibility as their father. It is your responsibility as their mother to teach them the ways of the Lord. Are we together? So don't just assume because you are born again, your children will automatically be born again. It is a lie. Take some time and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Therefore, I remind you, stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of, of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So one thing here the Apostle Paul wants Timothy to understand is that you are not free. You got, you mean, you're not just living anyhow. You've got a gift that has been deposited in you. Remember, when I laid my hands upon you, that is something you received. That something is the gift of God. It came to you freely, but you have a responsibility to cultivate that gift, to work out that gift, to put that gift into practice. Yes, God gave you freely, but we've got a responsibility. And this is where we as believers, we miss it. Just because we are in the dispensation of grace, it does not mean that you have to negate the place of diligence and hard work. And so what kind of the kind of work that you are going to do, let it be under these parameters and the understanding that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So the gift of God for it to operate effectively, fear must be set aside. Get on the power 
and a love and of a sound mind. Make sure there is no fear. Number two, understand that you are divinely enabled to do that, to work out that gift. Number three, have a motive of love, a spirit of love as you work out the gift that God has placed in you. And above all, have the peace of mind. Sound mind. Eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. You remember Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for all, for the salvation of all mankind first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. The apostle Paul repeats this again to Timothy, letting him to be aware that he should not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. Hallelujah. And brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He says, listen, this is the mystery that we have, that Christ has defeated death. Talking about life after death. Death actually here, you know, we are, we are talking, number one, we are talking here, when, we, when, we, when Paul is, is addressing this, he's talking about this death. What is this death? Is it the physical death first? No, it is the sin. Sin is death by itself. Why we do we call sin death by itself? Because it separates you from God. That's what actually spiritual death is. So Christ Christ has taken away that great divide, that separation between man and his maker. He has breached the gap and now we can live. And so he tells Timothy, understand that this God, I am well and I have understood very well that I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able. This God, through Christ, who has abolished death, separation between man and God, this God, I am able to put my faith and my trust in him even though I am in chains, even though I'm being afflicted, even though I'm being uh, uh, persecuted because I know this God to be a faithful God. So he's communicating this to encourage Timothy that even though you are in afflictions, understand that God is able and God is faithful. And this I pass to you today by the glory for the glory of God. Understand this no matter... Sorry, what, whatever affliction you're going through, I want to encourage you today that trust in God. He is able and he is a faithful God. Hold fast the pattern of sound, of, of sound words or what we can call systematic theology that I presented to you, which you have heard from me in faith and in love, which are in Christ Jesus. That good, good thing which was committed to you Keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from him, among whom are Figelas and Amogens. The, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesphorus, uh, you know, which means refreshing. For the, he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. Now look at this person who the Lord used to minister to Paul, to refresh the hearts of Paul and the hearts of, uh, and the, hearts of the saints. And we shall look at it as we read the book of Philemon. Uh, is it tomorrow? Yeah, I think tomorrow. So the Lord, he says, this person who has refreshed my heart, the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So the Apostle Paul is saying this on if, uh, um for us. Look at this guy. He has been so gracious to, to, for, for me, you know, to refresh my heart. I just pray that the Lord will show him mercy. 
That's the simple principle. You know, when you do good to others, expect that God will work it on your side. Don't give up on doing good. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, do not be wary of doing good, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's, I believe, Galatians chapter, is it 6 verses 9 there? Do not be wary of doing good, especially to those who are of the household of faith. There is a reward. There is a recognition by heaven and also by righteous men that when you do good, mercies will be your portion. And I pray today, may this, those mercies that we are, you know, to be apportioned to this fella, may they be apportioned in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Two, chapter two, verses one. You therefore, my son, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus that the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. So be strong in the grace. Even though, yes, there is grace, you must make a conscious decision to strengthen your inner man. And as you strengthen your inner man, he's telling Timothy, it requires strength for you to continue in the work of ministry. Why? Because the things that you've had, uh, uh, you've had from me in the presence of many witnesses, this commit to other faithful men who will commit them to others. Right here is the pattern of mentorship and transferability of responsibility. Because if we have one man who consistently and faithfully walks in, in you know, uh, executes his responsibilities here on earth without passing them over, without delegating, then it means means we will come into a generation where responsibility is negated. But the Apostle Paul gives, you know, Timothy a pattern of taking what I instructed you in the presence of many witnesses. Don't die with it. Don't be mean with it. Look for other faithful men. And this shows you one of the greatest characteristics in the kingdom of God. It's not first anointed. Uh, it is not fame. It is not visibility. The thing that exists in God's kingdom that God really looks at, number one, is availability. Number two, faithfulness. Is this person available? Are they faithful? Then the rest will flow. So because you can give you know, a gifted person, a talented person, a well-charismatic person responsibilities, but guess what? If they are not faithful, if they are not faithful, if they are slack, if they're not diligent, if they are lazy, you may give them a responsibility no matter how anointed, no matter how gifted, no matter how graced they seem to look. If they lack faith, they'll not execute that thing the way God wants it to be executed. So Paul tells Timothy, look for faithful men, then communicate to them transfer to them, make them responsible the way I also found you, Timothy, to be responsible. And in the presence of many witnesses, I committed these words to you in the same pattern. Learn after me. This is a principle that assures continuity of the work of God. Are you found faithful? Can you testify that you're faithful? You know, one of the rewards of faithful people, if you want to know you are a faithful person, this is the sign. God gives, keep, you know, the rewards of faithful people is more work. That's the reward of faithful people, more work, not less. The more you are faithful in God's kingdom, that's how God promotes people. He does not first promote you with money. God promotes a faithful worker with more work. A faithful worker with more work. You have been faithful with this little takes the five talents, and he says, there are five more, you'll take care of them. Then faithful what happens, even the little that he had was taken away. Those talents are actually responsibilities. So God rewards the faithful with more work. If you see no new assignments in your life, probably you are not faithful. <sighs> 
you therefore verses 3 must endure hardship as a sold as as a good soldier of Jesus Christ no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlists him as a soldier and also if anyone competes in athletics is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules so the soldier and the athlete what they represent here is discipline are we together the hard-working farmer must first to, to be to be first to partake of the crops consider what i say and may the lord give you understanding in all our things Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not a chain. Underline that. You can chain people, you can kill people, but the word of God still remains to stand and it will continue to progress. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He says, the things that I endure, I don't endure them because I'm a, crim I'm a criminal, sorry, but I endure, I go through what I'm going through for the sake of the people who are elect. I'm going through these persecutions, I'm going through the, the chains, I'm going through a lot of hard hard work, you know, and all these things, the suffering, the cajoling, you know, the people, you know, people scheming against you, there are people who want you dead. He says, all these things I'm going for, not for fame, not for a not, not, not for financial reward, but I'm going through what I'm going through for the sake of the elect, that they may also ab ab obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. For this is the faithful saying, for if we died with him, that is in Christ, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny, he will deny us. But if we are faithful, he, God, remains faithful. Why? For he cannot deny himself. Wow. He says, even though you are faithless, even though you remain without faith, there's no time you'll say God does not have faith because God will never deny himself. You know, there are people who think because they are faithless that God remains, that God has, changes, has changed his nature, you know, uh, from being faithful, you know, to, 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 you know, to being unfaithful. No, it does not change the character of God from being who he is. You may be faithless, but God still remains to be true, for God cannot deny himself. Verses 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words, to no profit, to ruin the hearers. Be diligent. So there's a lot of words, a lot of strife. What happens? You're ruining your hearers. So be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. How are you doing this? Rightly dividing the word of a truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how God approves men. That's how God approves preachers, not by the loud voice, not by screaming, not by shouting, but you are considered a worker worthy to be in the kingdom of God when you have the ability to rightly divide the word of a truth. Wow. Verse 16. But shun profane and idle babbling, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Himaneas and Felis and Philitas are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past. These people are not approved, <laughs> workmen, worthy approved by God. 
Why? Because they have not rightly handled the word of our truth. They are saying the resurrection has already occurred, yet it has not occurred. So Paul is addressing Timothy here. In the same manner we saw in First and Second Thessalonians, with more so Second Thessalonians, when Paul, you know, attacks or corrects the issue of people saying that Christ has already returned. So Paul is telling Timothy, these people, they have erred, for Christ has not yet returned. Or the resurrection is not already passed. And they overthrew the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, not the person who God cleanses. There are a lot of people who are wondering, why am I not a vessel of honor? Yet I'm born again and you're waiting God in his own sovereign will to cleanse you. The apostle Paul says that if anyone cleanses himself. So this is not the work of the sovereign will of God. It is your responsibility to set yourself apart so that you may become a vessel of honor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and you shall be useful for the master prepared for every good work. So what stops a lot of people from pe being prepared for, for every good work is that they have not decided from the bottom of, heart, of their hearts that I'm going to be set apart for the work of God. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, Peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but avoid exchange, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate what strife. It's like telling, you know, live this kind of life, but the way you will live this kind of life is by negating this, this kind of life. If you want to live a life that is that is used of God, you must decide that I'm not going to live a life of idlers, Id, uh, you know, I, 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 I idle chatter, uh, you know, and talk and these other things so that I may be a worker that is approved by God. This is 24. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do is way. So look at those qualities of a servant of God. Not quarrelsome, gentle, teacher, teaching others, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them what? Repentance. So you're dealing with person with a person in the light that this person is a candidate of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That this person is a candidate of God's kingdom. And as a servant of the living God, I'm supposed to handle their matters like A, B, C, D, so that they may not, you know, resist the open door that God has opened for them. Chapter 3, verses 1. But know this, that in the last days, Perilous. These are hard times, tricky times will come. For men will be what? Lovers of themselves, looking inward. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents and unthankful. If, today we'll, if it is today, we'll put entitled, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haunty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. 
That's simply hypocrisy. You're having a form of godliness. You say, yes, I believe this is what the, the, the scripture says. I believe this is how believers should walk around. But you are actually not living under the transforming power of the word of God. That's what simply we talk. We say that it's hypocrisy. Ah. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gallable women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So a lot of people are eager, and I said that's one of the misgiving of our generation. We've got access to a lot of information. Today, just talk about a, a certain topic you know, in, in the church, and you say, you know, sometime I'll come and teach about this. There are people with each ears, they want to be the first, they will go and try and get this and get this and get this. Always, always hearing, always eager, never, ever, ever, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. It is a sickness where people want to hear the next new thing. Where, where, what is the next big thing? But there is little transformation that is produced by the knowledge that you're learning. Effectively putting what you learn into practice until it starts producing fruit. So it's from meeting to meeting. We are human doings, meeting to meeting. And I've got nothing wrong with meetings. But if you're going to these meetings and you're actually applying what you're being taught, you will be the best believer ever. Now, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. It is their stupidity, their, their lying shall be exposed. They will not go, they will not progress, they will not attain what they thought they will attain. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Tell him, Timothy, you are a witness of what I went through, but you are also a witness, you know, that through in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, that the Lord was faithful enough to deliver me. So whatever affliction you are going through, Timothy, the Lord is faithful to deliver you. And you, my fellow viewers or my listeners, if you're listening to us through podcast, please, I pray and I beseech you, there is no affliction that is so great that can turn God to be an unfaithful God. Mm -mm. Whatever situation you're going through, I'm encouraging you today, whatever trials you're going through understand that your God is a faithful God keep on putting your faith in him and you shall indeed witness and testify of his deliverance in your life yes verses 12 and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution underline that those who desire take your highlighter like this and do it yes and those who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will do what will suffer persecution that people will call you jokers there are others who will plot against you but he says but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse deceiving and being deceived but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. He says, these things you will go through them, but this is what I need you to do. You must be focused in regards to what you've heard. You must be focused in regards to what you've believed in. You must be focused in regards of the relationship that I have with you. Because these things you heard from me, you have witnessed the manner of my living. You have witnessed the way I've been focused, even though I'm in the presence or experiencing trials in my life. 
and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. Holding on to what God says gives you the strength to be sustained in times of crisis, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So look unto the word, study the word, hold on the scriptures. The ones that brought you to salvation are the same scriptures that will sustain you in your walk with the Lord for all scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for what purpose? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The authority and revelation of scriptures. This is one of the most powerful scriptures that support the authenticity of the word of God as, as, as the word that actually was inspired by the Holy Spirit in the lives of those who wrote it. So the Apostle Paul tells the Timothy, continue holding fast to those words because those words are your life. They are, the light, they are a lifeline that God breathed through the authors that were writing these scriptures to you. Four, chapter 4 verses 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in the season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines. It will be so hard for people to endure, uh, to endure, you know, sound doctrines, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This scripture is coming alive every single day of this 21st century that we are living in. People are heaping up teachers who will tell them what they want to hear, but they will not want to endure sound doctrine. Don't be one of them. But you, be watchful in all things. Be a watchman. Be careful, Timothy. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Keep on weakening souls. Be focused in kingdom advancement. Be focused to make proofs of your ministry or to fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on the day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What is the Apostle Paul trying here to do? He's trying to tell Timothy, live after this kind of life. It has a reward. I told you in the last letter, fight the good fight of faith. Now I'm telling you, I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. I fought the fight. I've kept the faith. You know, it just tells Timothy, follow after my pattern. It has a reward. In this earth we shall depart. But if you look for the second appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, there shall be a crown that the righteous judge has kept for you. What a manner way of living. Living with eternity in perspective. Living with the reality of the afterlife. That there is a reward. Yes, we have been saved not by works, but remember, we have been saved for good works. And those good works, they have got an eternal reward. How are you working? How are you giving yourself to the work of the kingdom of God? It is th that thought that was able to sustain the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul is conveying that reality also to his spiritual son, Timothy, to uphold the scriptures, to uphold that mentality, to have that mindset of eternity raised you know upon him so that as he continues to live even though he is afflicted even though he shall be persecuted but he must know that there is a reward that will come after all is said and done
chapter 9, verse 9, sorry. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, you cannot love the present world and still keep on in step with the work of God. It's either you love God and his work, or you rather love the world and totally, you know, forsake the work of God. So this guy by the name of Demas was given to the pleasures of the world that he deserted the apostle Paul and the work of ministry. For Thessalonica, Christians for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. See, the others are going to Thessalonica to preach, that is Christians. To Galatia, Titus has gone. For Dalmatia, you know, and only Luke is left with when the others have been given to the work of ministry, Demas is being sent to the world. He just loves the world. And this shows the kind of Christians, two kinds of Christians. One that loves the world and pursues the things of the world. And the set of these other Christians, it talks about or it shows the figure of, of a believer who's so consumed with the word of God that yes, when they leave the presence of the church, that's the teacher of the doctrine, that's the apostle Paul, you choose whether you'll be like Demas to go to the word or whether you'll be like Tatus and... Uh, um, Uh, you know, uh, Titus and, and Dalma, uh, Titus who, uh, who went for Dalmatia, you can choose to be a person who goes to the world or a person who takes the gospel to the world. Which one are you? Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with me, for he is useful to me for ministry. A lot of people believe this is John Mark who, who actually you know, had deserted Paul and he made Paul and, and Barnabas actually uh, to, 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 to part ways. And the Bible says that Paul, uh, that, 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 that Bar Barnabas, you know, went with, which means the son of encouragement, went with John Mark and encouraged him, and encouraged him in the work of ministry. And now when days have passed, years have passed, the apostle Paul says, bring for me, come with me, John Mark, because he's an if. And it shows you just the work, you know, that Bar Barnabas was doing. He encouraged Paul in his early years in ministry, great companion for from Acts chapter number 13, just see him, you know, accompanying uh, Paul for the work of ministry. And now even when they depart uh, some places in Acts, he takes care of John Mark, who's actually a relative to him, and he builds him until he becomes so effective that now Paul says he is of great use for me in ministry. Don't give up on people. There are people who look stubborn, the people who look weak, but as a leader, it is a responsibility to encourage them in the word of the Lord that they may grow and be shaped up into the image and the likeness of of a God. And teachers I have sent to Ephesus, bring the clock that I left with Kappas at Troas when you came, and the books, especially the parchments. This shows you that Paul loved writing and Paul loved reading. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. But this is a person on his death row. They're just thinking about Alexander the coppersmith. Whatever Alexander did for Paul, to Paul, sorry, Alexander knows he didn't do a good thing. Because in the last days of the Apostle Paul, he just thinks about what Alexander did. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. He says, whatever he did to me, don't think he will not do it to you. And that's why I tell people, you see somebody eating your pastor, fighting your pastor, talking wrong about another believer somewhere, that very person, when you turn your back, don't think you are safe. Don't. You must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. If he resisted my words, Timothy, beware of him. He will also resist you. At my first defense, no one, sh no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Then jump to number 17. Look at how beautifully it begins. But the Lord stood with me. The rest forsook me. But the Lord, this Lord, he stood with me. So the message might be preached fully through me. And that all the Gentiles might hear. Might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. 
and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. People might desert you. Your friends might desert you. Your family might not understand you. But there is one who will never misunderstand you. And that person is God himself. He will never misunderstand you. He will never forsake you. Put your faith and your trust in him. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesphorus. Erastus stayed with me in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in, in uh, M M Miletus sick. Do your uttermost to come before winter. Yobalas, what a name, greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul is just pointing to us, just pointed to us a beautiful picture on how to live in the midst of perilous times, in hard times, in confused times, in an age where people are lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Right here, we have the key written by the Apostle Paul to his beloved son in faith, the, the man Timothy himself, teaching and instructing him in regards to how he shall live, even as a servant of the living God at the church in Ephesus, or now to stand and keep on walking in faith, even though the environment is not conducive for you to live out that faith. If this is not a beautiful letter to you, I don't know what it is. So tomorrow, we are going to jump through titles, and I think... Um, yeah, Titus and, and we shall join it together with the book of Philemon and it's going to be a wonderful time in God's presence. So go ahead, read it, be encouraged in the word of the Lord and see you tomorrow. May the Lord watch over you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine towards you. May he be gracious to you in all your doing. See you tomorrow with lots of love. Shalom.